at the same time, we're going to really start to respect and admire people that can do stuff. The person who can renovate, the person who can take charge and actually fix things in their own home, the person who can make stuff and do stuff and fix things, that person is going to be more self-sufficient. We feel like the world is completely out of control. The world's tanking, investments are tanking, we don't know who's in charge, we don't know who to trust. Intellectuals have gotten us here. They thought of all these financial derivatives and instruments the rest of us couldn't understand. They gave them funny little acronyms, and now we realize maybe they didn't even know what they were doing. So suddenly we realize it's time to take charge locally, and that starts off in our own homes. And what do we have to do? We have to make something. We've got to mend something. We've got to grow something. We've got to do something really that's tangible, and that may start with building a vegetable garden. It may start with um, making your own patio. It may start with retiling your own bathroom. It's going to start really small, doing things in your own space that makes you feel powerful. And it's going to start with home repairs. It's going to start by basically doing the things you used to hire somebody else to do. It's also going to start by, but with pooled cooperatives or cashless cooperatives. You're going to start to see one of the things going on where people are going to start to swap services in their own neighborhoods, in their own local environments, where they're going to basically swap out, I can do this and I have no skills doing that. Can somebody else pick up my slack? And you're going to see new um, groups develop where people are going to share these skills so that they can really get practical things done without expending any cash. Cashless barter is really going to be on the rise and practical skills are going to be a lot of what gets created. We're going to see, too, a lot of looking backwards to learn because nobody really can understand how we've gotten to the place we've gotten to. How could we be so slick, so connected, so turned on, so tuned in, and so dumb? How is it possible that with all the news we didn't have any knowledge, with all this insight we seemingly had, how is it possible that all the things that have gone on, from a subprime crisis to a prime crisis, to something along the lines of Madoff, or the guy in Texas, or the collapse of Iceland. How are any of these things possible, and what can we learn from history? And then I think there's going to be a new groundswell, which we're just starting to um, see, and I don't know how many of you are tracking it yet, but the relationship between the word Nazi and the word nationalism. But as we're starting to see conversations about the nationalization of banks, we're going to start to see people really demanding that people study the history of the Nazis and just the correlation of those words and what do those words mean and what kinds of questions do we have to ask ourselves about independence and freedom and what we're going to see again and again, more respect for elders, more respect for history and a real desire to go back and re-embrace history and learn from it. So whether it's learning about the 30s, learning about Lincoln as um, President Obama has been sort of driving home with lots of Lincoln references, going back to study Darwin. Um, you're going to see that. You're going to see it on a simple level, people re-embracing the public library. So a destination in a local municipality is going to be the public library. People giving back to the library and people going back there to figure out how in the world these things happened. So one of the few things I think people are going to give money to um, day in and day out is going to be the local library. They're going to see people going back to the library, spending time in the library. I think Starbucks is going to be upstaged on a day-to-day -day basis by the library as a destination. People will make their own coffee, they'll put it in the thermos, and they'll head to the library to do their own reading. Um, we're not going to do any of this without technology. I um, can't imagine very many people who are unconnected um, staying that way, and I don't think that anybody who's going to cope is going to really cope in an unconnected way. Because technology is here to stay, and you really can't compete, unless you're going to compete state-of-the-art with all those tools. As a matter of fact, when you talk to people about what they're prepared to give up or compromise on, uh, personal technology isn't even part of what's your recessionary mix. You need to have state-of-the-art TV, you need to have state-of-the-art connectivity, state-of-the-art telephony, state-of-the-art um, internet, um, wireless, and so on. And that's just the cost of being alive. It's really no different than having um, a decent dentist and a decent healthcare practitioner. As long as you're bringing money into your home, you need to have those things to be able to cope. And I think that's a real big difference than ever before. The real truth is that we believe in order to be competitive ourselves and to raise competitive children, we've got to master these new technologies, we've got to stay ahead of these new technologies. And if anything, I think we're going to see people driving forward with a recognition that they are going to have to be part of circles where they get into that. So I would argue, just as we've formed book clubs in the past to stay literary and enlightened, 
you're going to see people forming small circles to engage in um, learning about new technologies in a friendly, community-based way where they try things out and try things on and have a chance to really get comfortable and familiar with because they are very fearful of being left behind. And I think you're going to see an awful lot of manufacturers and marketers step in, facilitate those kinds of arrangements because everybody is going to want to step up and be state-of-the-art in this kind of competitive environment. Um, one big change you're going to see suddenly is um, an embrace of maturity. I think a real fear that a lot of youthful, unbridled enthusiasm, perhaps irrational exuberance, if you would, got us into some of this mess. And suddenly, maybe wisdom is going to help us get out. Um, President Obama put it in his inaugural address, the time has come to set aside childish things. But I think what we are going to see is that, well, it's going to take a long time, maybe as long as three or four years, to get the economies really growing again. We're going to have to both hold on to the hopefulness of eternal youth and also sober up. And with that, sobriety is going to come a real maturity. We are not going to be able to go off helter-skelter. And really a desire to embrace maturity and to get rid of hyperbole, get rid of all of the hype that has been um, the last several years is going to, um, I think, be a big transformation. You're going to see a lot of desire for people to embrace the mentor, to embrace mentoring. And mentoring is going to come in two directions. It's going to be older and younger. People are going to embrace technology mentors that are younger, and they're going to embrace lifestyle mentors that are much, much older, that have more wisdom and more sense of how do you get through certain kinds of times. Especially because you're going to see divorce go by the wayside. Divorce is going to be something that people used to be able to do when they could afford to break up real estate. And it's going to be something that is not going to be called upon with any level of frequency as a solution to a marital dispute any longer. And I think that um, with that is going to come a new maturity as well. You're going to see um, a lot more interest in what I'm going to call wellness messaging. But by wellness messaging, I don't mean just health messaging. I mean getting ahead of the whole health question because um, globesity is really going to be one of our real areas of destruction. The extra large indulgence, just the degree to which we have gotten bigger and wider. I don't know how many of you realize this, but we have a crisis in our hospitals because the toilets that are sitting on the walls of hospitals can't accommodate the patients that come in to be patients. The, the people have gotten so heavy and the toilets were configured by and large with the old infrastructure to accommodate people that were much smaller, and a lot of the toilets need to be rebolstered or they will fall off the wall. The coffin industry, the funeral industry, has had to reconfigure because uh, coffins weren't large enough. Um, there's been a lot of economic gain in and around the whole obesity industry, and we're going to see a big pushback. Because while that may be an area for growth is as we get larger and larger, it's also a huge cost. It's been a huge drain on the insurance system. It's been a huge drain on people's health. You're going to see a number of H themes emerge, health, holistic, and hydrate. And water, particularly free water, tap water, is going to be one of those things that people are going to be very big on. Right now, I'd argue that if you sit down in a restaurant and you order bottled water, somebody's going to give you the evil eyeball. They're going to say, you're so presumptuous. You're so pretentious. There's something very, very taboo about ordering bottled water today. There's a feeling that water has got to be free and accessible to everybody versus peddled as a gourmet side dish. We are really over that. That is really one of those things that's left over from some time that now feels a long time ago and was really very just last year. But the great debate about clean water is just starting because the next world war, should it unfortunately be fought, is as likely to be fought over water and access to clean water as it is over oil. Because that's how dire the situation and access to water could be, particularly in the Middle East. Um, and I think this fight over water um, is going to come very, very hard and very, very fierce. But the idea about wellness messaging and talking about wellness and making people aware of the importance of physical and mental wellness during these economic times is going to fall onto every entity, every organization. And each and every one of us is going to become much, much more attuned to what is the cost of illness. What is the cost of mental illness? What is the cost of physical illness? And what is the cost of, of psychological disruption?